So, good morning. My name is Jessica Asawala, and this summer I worked in Dr. Sakya Putanito's lab, investigating circular RNAs and long-term long water storage. So, protein coding genes make up 1% of the human genome. Recently, a greater focus has been placed on remaining 99% of non-coding genes and the corresponding RNAs. Non-coding RNAs fall into several classes, including circular RNAs, which are produced by backsplicing. So unlike canonical splicing, where introns are removed to give linear mRNAs with the caps on the five prime ends and the poly A tails on the three prime ends, circular RNAs can include multiple or just one exon, only introns, or both exons and introns, and antisense circular RNAs that do not have these poly A tails, so are harder to identify using traditional RNA sequencing methods. So this clustering structure of the molecules makes them more stable, and although they can range from 200 to 6,000 nucleotides, on average they are about 1,000 nucleotides long. So some of the functions of circular RNAs include regulating the transcription of their parental genes by interacting with RNA polymerase II. They can also uh, function as sponges for microRNAs and ribosome binding proteins, and they can um, circular RNAs with internal ribosomal entry sites have the potential to participate in protein translation. So circular RNAs have been implicated in learning and memory. Like I just mentioned, uh, they can regulate the transcription of their host genes, and we know that long-term memory formation requires the novo gene transcription. Circular RNA dysfunction has also been involved in neuropsychiatric disorders, including Alzheimer's disease. So how do we study long-term memory storage? So contextual fear conditioning training produces long-lasting fear memories, and it is used as a model to understand cer uh, cer cellular, molecular, and circuit mechanisms underlying long-term memory storage. So this involves three groups. First, the mouse is put into this context that should not elicit a fear memory. Then the mouse is put uh, in the separate group. The mouse is given a shock that does elicit a fear memory. And then finally, in the third group, the mouse is put into that previous context and given a shock. And the goal is to test if the mouse can retrieve that fear memory from the previous context. And so we wanted to know where the circular RNAs that are involved in memory storage being expressed. And since we know that the hippocampus is the memory and learning center of the brain, we decided to analyze circular RNAs within the subregions of this brain structure. So one of my first tasks in this project was to analyze microarray data from hippocampal samples from mice that had contextual fear conditioning training. So I wanted to look for circular RNAs that were differentially expressed across all three groups. So when we look at the context and shock group compared to the, con to the context alone group, and then the context and shock group compared to the shock alone group, we saw three upregulated circular RNAs and one downregulated circular RNA. And so then we uh, looked into the, gene, the parental genes of these circular RNAs, which included QARS, PGKI, CNTM3 for the upregulated, and the downregulated uh, gene was PAFH, IV2. And so here is some data with the p values and the corresponding gene symbols. So my next task was to create some primers to experimentally identify these circular RNAs. So using a combination of these two sequences, for example here, the QARS gene is about 479 um, nucleotides long. I created a set, primer sets for each gene that included primer pairs for, that were circular RNA specific, linear RNA specific, and common to both. To create the circular RNA primers, I used these two um, sequences to identify the black, back splice regions which is where the three prime end meets that five prime end. And so the primers would span this black splice uh, junction in order to differentiate them from the linear primers. And so then I wanted to experimentally identify these circular RNAs. So I would extract the RNA from hippocampal tissue and also use laser capture microdissection to isolate subregions within the hippocampus, such as the dendrite gyrus, CA1, and CA3. Following RNA extraction, I would isolate the RNA using mini prep and pupa pure kits. 
And so laser capture microdissection allows us to reach those small subregions. And so here you can see the laser is dissecting the dentate gyrus that has been stained with crystal violet. And as the laser cuts the tissue, it begins to fall into this little cap that is within the microscope. This was one of the clear cuts they did not all look like this. And so next, I wanted to enrich my pool of total RNA to have mostly circular RNAs. And we did this using a high purity circular RNA isolation method called RPAD, which stands for RNAs R treatment, followed by polyadenylation and poly A RNA depletion. And then we wanted to optimize this protocol using time series. So this method involves taking the total pool of RNA, which includes linear mRNAs and circular RNAs, and treating it with RNAs R to remove all those linear RNAs with poly A tails. But with those linear RNAs that remain, we then add more poly A tails so that when they are treated with the second RNAs R um, treatment, they will, we will hopefully end up with a pure population of circular RNAs. So when I did this method, I wanted to analyze the quality of the isolated RNA. And so this is a bioanalyzer profile for isolated RNA, and the different peaks show that there are certain species of RNA. The red line shows our total RNA. The blue line shows uh, the RNA species after the first RNase R treatment, after the poly A treatment is in green, and finally, after the second RNase R treatment in cyan. And so we can see that the loss of peaks from total RNA to the second RNase R treatment means that the treatments are working. And so we wanted to optimize this protocol and we wanted to see if maybe different incubation periods after each treatment could have a different effect. The protocol originally calls for 30 minute incubations, but we wanted to see if maybe one hour, two hour, or three hours had some difference. And so we can see that the longer incubation does not seem to improve RNA yield. And this may be due to some experimental error or RNA quality. So we decided to just use one hour incubation. Next, we wanted to see if RNAs concentration, RNAs R concentrations had an effect. And so that difference between the two microliters and the three microliters may be due to a pipetting error, but we decided to go with one microliter, considering RNAs R is one of the most expensive uh, enzymes. And then, so then we wanted to test these primers on RNA isolated from tissue. Here we're looking at the hippocampus and the cortex, and these qPCR results tell us that there may be room for improvement on these primers, but so far it looks that they could, looks like they consistently show distinct en enrichment between linear and circular RNAs. And so then we wanted to test these primers on samples that we isolated um, using the laser capture microdissector. And so the circular RNA primers are differentially enriched within the dentate gyrus compared to the other subregions and we can see this across all three genes. So finally, hippocampal subregion specific enrichment of the circular RNA primers was seen within the dentate gyrus compared to CA1 and CA3. Future experiments could repeat what I did with, after different learning and memory tests, and we could also look into the microRNA interactions and distinguish dorsal and ventral subregions, also use fluorescence in hybridization. And so these are some of the scientific takeaways, but I personally learned a lot from this experience. I was unfamiliar with circular RNAs and how little is known about these molecules. Um, earlier in my presentation, I mentioned that I identified four uh, circular RNAs that were differentially expressed, but I only made primers for three of them. This was because that DGKI gene um, the, for the circular RNA sequence and the parental RNA sequence, they didn't really match up, which tells us that this could be a backsplicing transcript isoform which can, um, from further reading, I found that these kinds of isoforms can affect regulatory pathways. And so this is just opens up the door for circular RNA potential as therapeutic targets and within mechanism, mechanisms. And so I also uh, wanted to think about circular RNAs in a different context. Uh, someone in another high school intern in high school intern in my lab worked on an AI project, and I'm also a computer science major, so this got me thinking about how we could intertwine those two and maybe program something to predict these backsplice junctions and maybe even help us design better primers. And then I had never worked with RNA experiments. I was unaware of how 
temperature sensitive these molecules are and how ubiquitous uh, enzymes that degrade RNA populations uh, are within, honestly, everywhere. And I had never designed primers, but I really enjoyed aligning the sequences and using the NCBI website to try to find the best possible pairs. And finally, I loved using scientific technology. Had never used qPCR, nanodrop, bioanalyzer, or the LCN. And of course, I loved using the cryostat to slice up those brains. <laughs> Even when um, I get frustrated when the brains are pulled onto themselves, I was trying to get them onto the slide. I think that's something that I'll really take away from this is when you get frustrated, you cannot let that stop you and you learn something from whenever something doesn't work right, whether you learn it about your project or yourself. And so with that, I would like to thank the Pritam Vito lab, Dr. Pritam Vito, Bindu, Clarissa, and Eddie, whom I worked with more closely, and the whole lab with all of their support, Dr. Rosie, Dr. Karpstein, Paolo, and the rest of the Serve sort of program and of course NSF for funding this experience. Questions? Questions. Okay. Yes. One of the first slides you mentioned that circular RNAs act as some sort of sponge. Can you explain what that means when yes. they act as a sponge? So that basically means that they um, have these sites where different kind of things can bind. I mentioned that they were microRNA and ribosomal binding proteins. So with microRNAs, they can um, literally like soak up those microRNAs that can affect mRNAs and the, like they can affect the different expression of microRNAs. There's one question in the chat. It says, can you say more about your personal lessons learned in the process of doing the work? Um, yeah, so a lot of the times with my experiments, they didn't really go as planned, and so that could be really frustrating. Um, so I think that taught me a lot about patience and also about uh, just like following protocol and realizing that kind of like with a recipe, you may have all these steps, but so much can go wrong and so much can be done to like improve it and change it up. I have a question. You may have explained this, and I just missed it. At the, so, when you you initially did a microarray experiment to identify these um, uh, circular RNAs, and then you verified that with the qPCR. So, I understand how the qPCR can distinguish between a circular RNA and you know a spliced out intron or you know what uh, you know other RNAs, but I don't understand how the original microarray experiment can efficiently distinguish. Were there spots on the microarray specifically also designed against the splice junctions, or does the microarray in fact pick up everything? So I did not personally do the microarray experiment. I um, just received the data mm -hmm. that helped Got it. Um, I arrived, but that's a great question. And I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. And does you, do, do the, from the qPCR, do you have an estimate of how abundant these three circular RNAs are that you're looking, that you were looking at? Um, like, is, are there like five copies in the cell? Are there 500 or are there 10,000 copies in the cell? Like, I'm actually not sure about that. Mm -hmm. You'd have, some, have to have some standard. I don't know if you have mm -hmm. Cool, really nice work. Thank you.